Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. Really excited today because we always seem, Zach, do we not, to somehow let the poor Jordan slide be like somewhere outside of our radar. Yeah, but that's because, you know, Napoleon, Wellington, World men, War stuff. war, yeah. you know, the, all the stereotypes. I'm very sorry, but that's kind of what Marcus and, and I tend to do. Yeah, it's bad. But we're rectifying it today, aren't we? We are. We are. So we have Sarah Murden with us, who is going to basically complete our education as we discuss Georgian women who weren't really anything like what you might expect, because we've got spies, we've got self-destructing letters, bogus journals, and one of the brains behind William Wilberforce. So to talk us all through it, we have, as I say, Sarah, who is a genealogist, and a historian who co-runs the blog All Things Georgian and is co-author of a number of books of the period, including An Infamous Mistress, The Life's Loves and Family of the Celebrated Grace Dalrymple Elliot, and All Things Georgian, Tales from the the Long 18th Century. Sarah, how are you doing? Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to have you on. Yeah, this could be really excited. Rarely do I see Zach get excited about something that doesn't involve Napoleonic warfare, but uh, he was well chuffed with this one. Excited because there's exploding uh, or dissolving letters and things. That's the truth of it, isn't it, Zach? See, if if we don't get some kind of dodgy 007 reference in here, then <laughs> no, we failed. Yeah. <laughs> so what do people expect of women in this period, Sarah? How deeply entrenched are the ideas of a public sphere for men and women just existing behind closed doors? I think I mean I think the, the public sphere is, is very much for the men. Um they were pretty much free to do what they liked within their social class. So, you know, for the upper class it was hunting, shooting, fishing running their estates and basically, you know, living the life of Riley. For the pre or average person, it was, or average man, it was working. Um, the little wife would stay at home and raise the children. And if you're working class, she probably had to work as well. So I don't think it was a great life for, for women. If you were a woman in the upper class, um, then... Again, staying at home, running the house, looking the part and producing the air and the spare. That was pretty much a woman's role. What was the stigma like if you didn't fulfil that kind of, if you didn't fit into that box then? Hmm, Good question. I think for, I think for sort of working class women, I I think, hmm, how to phrase it, I think you were taught by your parents that the expectation was that somewhere along the line you find a husband and you'd settle down and marry and have children and perpetuate the the line. Um, And I think that is what most women did. If they didn't marry and remain the the sort of old spinster, then they would, the expectation was that they would stay at home, look after the elderly parents um, and just eke out their days doing whatever was required. Um, in the upper classes, though, um, again, it, it was, was pretty similar. You, you were the old, the old maid, the, the maiden aunt who was dragged along to every uh, social event. Um, and it was just sort of, oh, dear. Oh, oh, that's a bit of a shame. You never married. Um, it was that sort of view, really, of, of women. So there's a contradiction here, isn't there? That if you're working class and a woman... You're expected to go out and work. But if you're from the upper echelons of society, if you were to do any work, that would be deeply frowned upon. How do people kind of get their heads around that dumb contradiction? I think it was just the way it was. Not not the way that we were. I think it I think the difficulty is that we we can only understand what it was like from documents that have been written. Um, and that there is very, very little written um, by your average woman of the 18th century or 19th century, come to that. Um, so we can only learn from what memoirs and things like that have been that have been left. So it's it's really difficult to judge, to be quite honest. Let's celebrate then, because this is kind of like it's 
it's sad when you hear this, isn't it? It's just like, but this is the history of women is being sort of secondary to men and being the adult. But let's celebrate women that said bugger that in the Georgian period. Let's talk about the life of Charlotte Biggs. And we should warn listeners, uh, she she does have a rough start and she is exposed to the very worst uh, that society can chuck at her. Um, in the victim of abduction and sexual assault, is that right? You say she was taken hostage twice. Who is she and, and how does she end up being taken hostage? <laughs> right, okay. So, yes, bugger to that. Charlotte, as she preferred to be known, her, her proper name was Rachel Charlotte. So she kind of defied convention from the start. Uh, her parents named her Rachel Charlotte, but no, she was going to be Charlotte. She was... <sighs> Gosh, she was a woman that lived life on her own terms. We first came across her when we were doing some research for another book. And we came across a place that doesn't doesn't exist anymore in Fulham, which was Peterborough House. And that was owned by the Earl of Peterborough and his wife. And whilst we were looking for that, we were trawling through newspapers and there was a, a mention of a, a, um, a suspected rape. And we thought, oh, right, OK, let's try and find out more about it. And it turned out it was a servant girl who had, had either had been raped or had cried rape, um, which counted for very little at that time. And basically she just fled. End of story. But we didn't let it go at that. We, we kept sort of trawling around, sort of Google and things like that, trying to find out more, you know, to, using every search term we could think of for rape, abduction, hostage, Peterborough House. And eventually we came across a document by um, the author and poet, Marius Kozijowski, um, who, if you don't know his work, he's, he's worth checking out. Um, and he had come across what was called a testament, in other words, an account of a woman that was written in 1821. And she was basically, it's all a bit mysterious because there's, uh, Mr. H underscore, and his name's left blank. Mr. B underscore, name left blank. Anyway, Marius did a lot of, of digging to, to try and work out what on earth this document was all about. Um, and eventually worked out that the, the document was a letter or a testament written to Sir David Octoloni, who was a really sort of big wig out in India. And it was written to him from the first love of his life. And that was Charlotte. And what she was doing, basically, was writing an account of, well, you've cleared off to India, left me on my own. I'll update you on what's happened in the past, uh, what's it, uh, 20, 30 years since you went away. And in, in this testament, she tells him all about the fact, well, after you'd gone, you might want to know, um, and it's all kind of nicely phrased and everything, um, that Mr. H, who we can only assume Octoloni would have known what the H stood for, um, Mr. H abducted me, took me to his house um, and assaulted me and kept me a prisoner there. Not as you say, not once, but but twice. The, the first time was at his property in, um, or just near the, the House of Commons, just near Westminster Bridge. And she eventually managed to escape from there. She was, I mean, she was obviously quite a, an astute. I mean, bear in mind, she was only, what, sort of 20 at the time. Um, but she kind of played for time. And she asked for some books and some needle needles and thread. And she basically tore out um, pages from the book and formed a message, which via the apothecary who visited the house, she managed to um, sneak it to him. He got it to a friend of theirs, a family friend. And having done that, um, they sent a carriage for her and, and took her home. So, you know, she wasn't short on brains in terms of trying to figure out how to actually make her escape. So she went home, um, you know, looking completely dishevelled and, and just, you know, complete sort of skeleton, really. Uh, was home for a while and then he managed to abduct her for a second time. And, what is wrong with this guy? And he was obsessed with her. 
he was absolutely and utterly obsessed with her. Um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going into the, the, the details are in the book. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll kind of spare listeners that. Um, but he was obsessed with her. He wants, he just wanted her and he wanted to keep her and couldn't sort of get into his head that the way to win a woman's heart was not to abduct her and to hold her hostage. It doesn't work <laughs> and didn't work. So he does. So having, fa- having failed once, he tried again. I was going to say, so he does um, do it again. And yeah. It, what happens to him? Does anything happen to him? He, she gets away again, doesn't she? Yeah, she, she eventually, yeah, she got away from, um, from him eventually. And um, <laughs> she went off to a convent in France, presumably to recuperate from it all. Um, what happened to him? He found somebody else and married a few months later, as if it had never happened. And he was so jail- no jail time or anything. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Zach's got his head in his hands. It's just like, so. It's okay. <laughs> Do just if you want a woman, just steal her twice, um, yeah. and then nothing will happen to you. Yeah, exactly. So that that and that's that's what he did. He he just she, women were commodities to to such a man at that time. They they had about as much importance as as your, your horse or your dog. You could just use them, and and in this case, you could use them and abuse them. And if you think about the likes of um, Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, um, who ended up spending her marriage in a, a menage a trois. Mm. Yeah. You know, she didn't she she didn't behave as she was expected to behave, um, and hubby just sort of thought, oh well, you know. I'll have a, I'll just take a lover. Oh, and she can move in. Oh, and by the way, you can stay as well. Well, and, that you know, and you know, know, you know, is a child for you to raise as well. Yeah. Even yeah. before that, if that yeah. happened, it was in the film. Well, the, the daughter, uh, the reason for the sort of interest in her as well is that um, the child, if, if you remember from the film, she's left with, um, or he presents her with a sort of five or six year old child to to raise, it, what did she say? He said something like, it would be good practice for you for when you have a child to basically get on and rear her. Mm. Um, and I, my mind working the way it does, I thought, I wonder what happened to that girl? So on the All Things Georgian blog, there is what became of her on there so um i kind of can't let go of things like that (laughs) i was just so incensed by the fact that that anybody could actually do that and i don't think that film's terribly far away from the the true situation um and then you've got people like um seymour worsley lady worsley um and she was she was another one that she ended up having affairs while her sort of lecturer's husband was was being a voyeur and watching her so I think he instigated a lot of that so it wasn't a great time to be a woman but it was a great time to be a man it seems yeah I mean <laughs> all of the the parallels with because it, with it when you know you talk you look at crime and and all these things as a researcher and you come across this kind of stuff in spades and mm. it, the the number of instances where wealthy men took advantage of to use a, a huge the kind of over euphemistic term yep. um domestic servants um particularly if they had to to live in as part of their duties it's just horrendous and it just goes to show that actually very little has changed to the kind of fundamental level in terms of attitudes to women in the last kind of 200 years yeah, and I think I think sort of the uh, the recent news sort of confirms that, doesn't it? In a way, doesn't it? Just we have we moved on? Women didn't feel safe in the 18th century, and do they feel safe today? You found though, when you were looking at Charlotte Biggs, that she completely reinvented herself, didn't she? How did she end up organising King George yeah. III's Golden Jubilee? Oh, absolutely, she invented herself. I think maybe the, um, the the period of time in the convent gave her thinking time, which is perhaps what she needed. Um, but yeah, but she came back to to England, and she was a great one. The the, the reason we know um, a reasonable amount, there are still an awful lot of unanswered questions about her and her life, and how much of what she said was true. Um, but 
she was a great one for letter writing. She just kept writing letter after letter after letter. She, trying to put her sort of social class to, together is really, really difficult. She wasn't working class and she wasn't in the upper echelons. She was somewhere, I guess what we'd call middle class. Um, and she, but she knew people. She knew men in influential positions. And I don't think that that, I don't think she knew them for any, from any other reason than perhaps they were acquainted with her father or something like that. And she was a real um, royalist. And she decided, she took it upon herself to decide that something needed to be done to commemorate George III's Golden Jubilee. So what am I going to do? How am I going to make this thing happen? I know. I'll sit down and I'll write letters to each of the town leaders. So she sat down and she, for example, she'd write to, say, Nottingham. And she'd say, oh, uh, George III's Golden Jubilee in October of 1809 maybe you'd like to do something to commemorate it so why don't you organize a feast for nottingham and then she'd write another one to say lincoln i understand that nottingham are going to be holding a feast for george the <laughs> third maybe you'd like to do something like organize a feast and organize fireworks oh right okay so that's got nottingham and lincolnshire involved or counties or districts or whatever and then she drives to Yorkshire. Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire are holding feasts and fireworks. Wouldn't it be good if you had church services and hog roasts? And she just perpetuated this until she'd got over a thousand letters written. But she was clever because she was, at the time, she was living just outside Chepstow. So she'd go into, which is not too, too far from Bristol, so she'd catch the, um, the, carry, the, uh, the coach to Bristol. She wouldn't, post, she didn't, because she was so private, she said, oh, I'm not going to post them from Chepstow. It could be traced back to me. I'll post them from Bristol. But she didn't send them out from Bristol. She sent them from Bristol to London to a friend who worked at, uh, in Parliament. And, and they then sent them on to, you know, it was basically, so in other words, it was going out from the government, not from this little lady, middle-aged lady who was living in, you know, the outer reaches of Chepstow. And um, eventually all, well, virtually all the towns around the country joined in with this celebration, doing feasts, church services, fireworks. She even got commemorative medals um, mm -hmm. organised as well. So she kind of, you know, it took a, took a lot of thinking, a lot of planning. You know, can you imagine trying to do that today as a one, one person? Did it get traced back to her? No, the reason we know about it is because <laughs> it was a few years later, and I think she was slightly on her uppers by then, and she wrote to um, an MP that she knew, uh, basically telling him how much she'd forked out for doing for organising this, and like, is there any chance of some reimbursement for all these letters and postage that I've, um, I've already spent on your behalf? <laughs> and they paid her. <laughs> so she was, she was, you know, she was clever. And she got Princess Elizabeth, one of George III's daughters, involved and um, was given a, a gift of the, the this writing desk as a, a thank you present for all her hard work and everything. And that becomes fairly crucial right at the very end of her life. Or no, after her, after her death. So, so yeah, she was, she was quite a woman doing that, really. She, am I, have I got this right? She ends up being one of the ladies who influences William Wilberforce. Yes. Yes, she did. As I said, she, she was a great one for letter writing. She wrote to everybody and anybody um, in Parliament that would take any notice of her. And what she was doing was, by, by the time um, Will, William Wilberforce sort of was uh, aware, or not, he wasn't aware of her um as such but she had been going backwards and forwards to france um finding out what 
what France was like, what the current situation was, and writing up notes and things like that and sending them back. And she was also, I mean, she, for a woman at that time, she took a great interest in not really, not necessarily politics in terms of who was in, in control and things like that, but how it was affecting the people of the country. And at that time, there was um, quite a, a degree of sort of poverty. And she wrote to William Wilberforce about the, uh, the, the cost of um, grain. And it was, she, she mentioned it in one of her letters to somebody else. And it was when you actually check back to the, the House of Commons um, in 1800, it was regarding the high price of provisions. And he actually, he said, that he was referencing a letter from a man who had been in France. But it wasn't a man, it was her. Um, but basically, by doing it that way, by saying it was it was from a man in France, uh, oh, one thing I haven't told you is there was a, a Mr Biggs um, who was her, hmm, well, we can only call him a companion because there's no evidence that they married, but she adopted his surname of Biggs and added that to the end of her Rachel Charlotte Williams. Um, and she and Mr Biggs were traveling around France, but we can't really figure out exactly what he was doing. We, we suspect he was a spy, but we, but we don't know. But if he wasn't, he was a great cover for what she was doing. So it gave her respectability by being Mrs. And it gave her the cover she needed to be a woman traveling around France. Um, so yeah, so it was, she wrote this letter to Wilberforce and he read it out and that was sort of it really. But she, she was in regular contact. Her main contact was Nicholas Van Sittart, who was the treasurer of the Exchequer at the time. Um, and she wrote lots of letters. She, he knew all about what she was doing. And I, I was actually, when, when I was sort of thinking about what we were going to talk about, um, I actually had a look at her, um, her accounts and everything again. And um, he funded her traveling around France. And, oh, I'm a bit short of money, and this is going to cost me this, and this is going to, to cost it. You can see where I'm going with this, can't you? So she could, she's like, I'm, I'm not going to be able to afford to do all, all of this traveling around and looking at what's going on. Um, do you think there's any chance of me having some money? And it's looking at her accounts, it actually translates to about £20,000 in today's money. <laughs> she's brilliant. I like her. We absolutely yes. loved her. She, it, but we're infuriated by her in equal measure, because it's like anything you you read. There's there's two sides to every story, um, but we were. Is she telling the truth? Isn't she telling the truth? Like really difficult to know how much was fiction and how much was fact, but. The writing desk actually holds some of the key to that. <laughs> so, but I'll leave that bit with you to think about. So she goes off to France. Um, you, you were saying at the beginning um, about the, the, the James Bond moments. <laughs> Nodding your head there. Um, yep, yeah, she, she's travelling around France and it was about 1815, 1816, something like that. And she'd been out and returned sort of early evening in a carriage with a servant and a coachman. And it was dark, so she waited in the coach whilst the, um, the servant went in to unlock and to get a light. And as she's sitting there, the coachman is sitting up on his, um, his seat, but somebody just suddenly throws something into the carriage and then speaks to her. Um, in English, but she said he was obviously French, basically saying, open this when you're alone. And then he just disappears, leaving her kind of with this package to, to open. So she gets back to her room, and she lights a fire, and she lights the, the candles and everything. And she, puts, she, she sort of looks at the package, doesn't really know what to make of it. And inside, there's a, um, a, a square of, of parchment 
and a couple of envelopes and some paper, which is a sort of yellow colour. So she opens, opens all of this up and she starts to read it. And the reader, when she reads it, it's a warning. It's basically telling her to get out of France, that she's in danger. He, whoever it is respects her, um, stay calm, do nothing, just get yourself out of there. So whoever it was was obviously expecting so either, either she'd blown a cover um, yeah. or something was going to kick off and she wasn't going to be safe. And then two minutes later, she's sitting there away from the fire, away from the candle, and the paper just spontaneously combusts. Zach looks sceptical. Well, exactly. Well, we were. The, the, the only reason that we're not is because we did some, did some more research into it and it wasn't unusual for that to happen. And also, that's quite a tall tale to be telling the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is exactly what she did. She wrote to him and said, this is, a, this is exactly what's happened. Um, basically, um, get me out of there. And did so she came back to England. There? Did he get her out of there? Yeah, yeah, she came back to England. But it, was, it wasn't much, uh, it was around that sort of time that a General Sarazan, who was one of Napoleon's generals, um, he fled from France. When he arrived in England, he created a bit of a, a stir because he wanted money from the, the British government. But he was put in effectively a safe house, which would mean probably very little to anybody, but it was on Frith Street, which is, um, it's actually next door to, you've heard Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club. Oh. It's next door to there. It's only when you know that um, Rachel's, uh, Rachel Charlotte's father owned that property, it was basically being used as a safe house. Wow, she's in she's, deep, isn't she? She's, she is in deep, definitely. You know, I mean, I suspect that, you know, in due course, that more information will, will come out about her. You know, so, but, but it's not going to, it's not like, well, I can't say it won't, but I don't think it's going to be anything that she's told anybody. I think it's going to be in letters that will appear that, you know, either she's either been mentioned in or, but she played everything so close to her chest. She really didn't, she wanted, she, she was a private woman. She didn't want... She didn't want the public acclaim for organising the Golden Jubilee. She didn't want anything, really. She just wanted to do right by her country. That, I think, to me, that's what makes her absolutely amazing. Do we know... See, is... oh, go on, Zach. See, are, are you about to tell us that this whole writing desk thing centres around some kind of hidden nook inside it where there's, there's secret information or something, or she's yeah, got, like, the equivalent of a cyanide capsule or something hidden away? <laughs> you wish. No, no, there's papers in there which um, confirm something. <laughs> Tell us, come on, you got it. You can't leave us hanging. No, no it's in the book. Oh, <laughs> no. I've got to say something, haven't I? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, let's move on to uh, I love her. Um, if you want to find out what was in that writing desk and what became of her, you are going to have to buy the book because uh, Sarah's not going to tell us. But she's also written about a pretty incredible woman by the name of Grace Dalrymple Elliot. What is her story? Uh, she ends up with an illegitimate child. I'm just looking because it says George, George the Fourth, George the Sixth, and I'm like, what, Bertie? No, it's <laughs> 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 no, 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 the wrong way around. I was like, no, I refuse to believe it. Not my Bertie. He had a it. God, and then I, but then I'm thinking equally, who'd want to have an illegitimate kid with that dick? But she did, <laughs> didn't she? Well, yes. But it, you've got to bear in mind that, that he wasn't very old at the time. <laughs> Who was she and how does this come about? Right. Okay, Grace. Um, she became the bane of our life for several years, trying to trace her story. Um, so she's born, she's a few years older than Charlotte, but not much. Um, she was born sort of 1753. Um, she's born in Scotland, got a couple of brothers and a sister. Um, the book uh is really it's trying to put into context her life into context really because there's been there's been a lot written about grace um a lot of it wrong um <laughs> we'll start with that bit so we just started piecing it all together 
and trying to to look at her i suppose as, as we would as we thought she ought to be looked at which was in the round you know with her family and and what made her do the things that she did because she seemed very much as this um high class courtesan who yeah yeah you're right had a trial with george the fourth not the sixth <laughs> <laughs> that blew my world <laughs> would have been a, quite an achievement yeah um but yeah grace i mean when it was pretty i think she had a pretty tough upbringing um but from a, a from an affluent family but her parents split up she's left with mum and a sister and two brothers in scotland father disappears off down to england and i think at, at one point ends up as um, I've forgotten what he was now, uh, Governor General out in the Caribbean. So you know they, they were quite a, a well-to-do family, and certainly a Scottish family were. Um, her mother died when she was about fourteen, and so she's left to be raised by her aunts in Scotland, who are feisty. <laughs> They're feisty Scottish women who took no prisoners. So, so I think she was quite you know. I think she could stand on her own two feet, put it that way. But dad takes her down, drags her down to London to marry this Dr. John Elliot, who is a much older man and quite boring. So this was kind of like the marriage made in hell. She's young, high spirited, wants to go out enjoying herself. He's uh, an, uh, a sort of well known, well respected doctor. Um, she ends up having an affair. You know, she, was, she got bored with him and had an affair. I think that was sort of, but at that time, women couldn't have affairs. It's fine for men to have affairs, but not for women. So because she had an affair, she, um, he, he divorced her. And is the, the short version of that story. Um, and so that's the thing. Look at him. <laughs> it's too much for you, Zach. The the listeners are probably glad this is a radio show and not a not a. <laughs> well, they can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> can't see. You. Oh dear. <laughs> um, you see, you can't make it up. That's the thing. Um, so he divorces her. He divorces her. So she's she's basically she's left to to kind of live on her wits. Um, she was glamorous. I mean, there's there's a couple of portraits of her that exist. Needless to say, they're over in America now, not not here in Britain, which is bad. Um, but she was her nickname was Dally the Tall, and um, because she was taller than your average woman, she was about five foot seven, I think, in comparison to five one five two. Um, she was regarded as a beauty in her day. Um, she ended up becoming a, a courtesan or high class escort because she needed she needed to work she needed to earn money and that was a way of doing it by getting by getting um, men to to support her and to look after basically to look after her um, so she began then she ended up having an affair with the Marquis of Chumley who. <sighs> I don't know really with that. It was a, it was one of those on off on off relationships. So I don't I don't quite know how that came about or or really what the point of it was to be quite honest because it, they they seemed to fall out. But their falling out was public. It was all in the newspapers. It was all the scandal and gossip of the day, and she was in the newspapers every day. So in terms of trying to piece her life together, it wasn't exactly difficult on that level because. The, the, the tab, if effectively she was tabloid fodder. Um, everybody wanted to know what she was wearing, who she'd been with, what parties she'd been at. Um, you know, so it was easy. It was kind of easy, easy press really for them. Um, so yes, yeah, so she's with Marcus of Chumley, who, if you ever want to, to to check him out, there was a poem written about him, and it was described as the torpedo or the electric eel. I'm not going to I'm not going to elaborate on that, but you can probably imagine what they were referring to. I'm um, already. Sorry, I'm googling him already. <laughs> Don't blame you. 
but he was supposed to be well endowed let's put it that way mm. um anyway this on off on off relationship um she eventually she they, they'd had enough of each other or, or one one way or the other which we don't know and um, so she went off to france and um she began a relationship with the duke of orleans before being enticed back apparently at the request of uh, Prinny, future George the Fourth, had a brief mm-hmm. fling with him, and um, the the result was a daughter. And um, she went on to marry into uh, the Cavendish Bentinks, people who own Welbeck Abbey in Nottinghamshire. But that's another book that has its own story. Um, so, so at what point does she end up in France? Because she's out there during the revolution, somehow manages yeah. to keep her head, unlike a lot of nobles yeah. at this point. But then I think I've got this right, that she was also allegedly a spy, like Rachel Charlotte. So what kind of similarities are there between the two of them? Oh, goodness. Um, yes, yeah, you're right. Um, I mean, Grace, did, she she had the child, she went and, and she, the child was raised by Chumley. So Grace then goes back to France during the French Revolution, and this is where um, she writes her uh, her journal, My Life During the French Revolution, some of which is, is fact, and we've, we've kind of trawled through line by line by painful line. Could she have been there? Could she have been in this, this prison? Um, a lot of it, I think a lot of it is true, but not all of it. Um, but she was... Um, she was spying for the, uh, the the government, and she was writing. Uh, and basically, she was writing to her do- her little daughter, who was being raised by Chumley. And it's in all likelihood what was happening was while she was, you know, it's a it's a letter letter to a little girl, but within that were was information being passed back to the the, the government. Uh, that's as far as we can understand it. So um, yeah. <laughs> Another one of your women is Dido Elizabeth Bell. Um, this one's interesting. She was mixed race. So what was life like for her as a woman of colour? Who was she? Where did she come from? Uh, where did she come from? Well, that's the million dollar question. We, we, don't, we still don't know where Dido was born. Um, but she was, well, I don't know where she was born. We, we are 99% certain she was born here in England. But her mother was a slave and it was a slave ship that was captured by Sir John Lindsay and she was pregnant well there were two accounts she was died uh, her mother was pregnant with Dido um, and gave birth to her in England according to one account and another account says she arrived here when she was a small child so we know she was baptised in London in 1766, but there's no age, so we, we're not 100% certain. But Sir John had, far, he far, Dido was the eldest, but he fathered five children in total. Um, the other four were fathered while I was out in the Caribbean, and one died in infancy, one we have no trace of at all apart from her baptism and the other two he brought back to uh, to the UK and they were raised in Scotland but Dido is raised mm. at Kenwood House by um by Lord William Murray so she led a, a very a very different life to what you would probably expect so she ends up living with Murray Lord Mansfield, who famously claimed that slavery did not exist in common law. This is the guy, for yep. folks who aren't aware, who's tied up in, in the Zong case about the, the slaves being thrown overboard, allegedly, um, in order to save the ship's supplies, but in actual fact, it was an insurance scam. Um, so in other words, Mansfield's ruling basically says that slavery can only exist if there was an actual piece of legislation explicitly saying and permitting slavery to exist and that in itself was a major boost for the abolition movement is there any sense of Mansfield being influenced by the fact that he's got Dido living with him I mean, that's, 
million dollar question, isn't it, really? Um, how could it, in a way, how could he not be influenced? Um, would, would be my take on it. Uh, if you if you ignore um, Dido's colour, she's a young, a little girl um, being raised in your house, uh, being treated, as far as we can tell, as far as documents show, you know, she's given money on her birthday, she's given money at Christmas, um, she's being raised as a, a, a gentle woman, I suppose, at the time. Um, bring into that her ethnicity um i just don't see how he, he couldn't have been influenced but whether how much he let that impact on his ruling that would only be for him to know you know he never wrote down uh, you know i make this ruling because i have a, a, a child living with me who is is not white you know there was an, it was never as explicit as that really but i i You've got to you've got to have been influenced. You've mentioned you've mentioned that some of these women become the bane of your life to a certain extent because this is really we've had um talks on here about trying to oh, I forget her name, hang on, I'll cut this. We've had Miranda Kaufman on talking about her book Black Tudors and about how taking sort of one fragmentary suggestion of someone's existence and something interesting about their story and trying to reconstruct their life around it is really quite difficult. And I think it's still the case in this time period as well, says the spoiled 20th century historian who's got stuff everywhere. How do you find these women's stories? How do you add to them? And, and what's the craziest place you've been to try and add to some of these stories? Oh, there's a question. Um, how do we find them? God, God only knows. <laughs> <laughs> we don't go. We don't go looking for them. I think. I think honestly, um, the 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 one of the books that we we've written, um, which is the Right Royal Scandal, which follows it effectively follows follows on from Grace, was our sort of starting point, and that was a throwaway comment that Joe made whilst we were looking for some, we were researching something completely different and she just said oh have you heard about the Romany girl that married into the aristocracy I'm like no 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 that can't possibly be true and that started us looking trying to find out whether there was any truth in that story which there was sort of no there was there was truth <laughs> There was truth. It was a, it was a gypsy girl who married into the Cavendish Bentinck family. She died, and then he remarried, and our present queen is one of his descendants. We didn't go looking for that story. It kind of found us, and having found that, led us back a couple of generations um, to Grace. And researching Grace's story led us to Peterborough House. And Peterborough's ha Peterborough House led us to Rachel Charlotte. Um, and then our latest book, which is about the Dukes of Bolton, there was a Mrs. Brown who was the mistress to one of the Dukes. And that's what led us to that, because Grace's, maiden, Grace's mother's maiden name was Brown. And this woman seemed to mix in the same circles. So we don't go looking for them. They find us. Um, it's, it's true on the, the um, All Things Georgian blog. I, I can sit there sometimes and think, what am, what am I going to write? And I'll start looking in the newspapers and I'll be, I'll be looking for something in particular and then something just grabs my attention. Um, and it's like, oh, that's interesting. And then I just start to research more and more and more. Uh, the, you asked me about the most un, unusual I I found myself stumbling around graveyards in the middle of nowhere thinking how has this become my life um have you had one of those moments oh I've done that <laughs> <laughs> I've done that I carry on doing weird things like that the most unusual is is actually with Rachel Charlotte's story um and that kind of gives will give Zach another clue um <laughs> see his face now it's like oh <laughs> I wrote to the Royal Archives um just to see whether I was trying to confirm this desk of Rachel Charlotte 
and I wrote to them and, and I didn't get a reply. And I thought, oh, how rude. Anyway, put it, <laughs> put it all to one side and we carried on with what we were doing. And it was a few months later and we got a reply back saying, really sorry for not replying. But we do have some correspondence here, but it's not from Mrs. Biggs, it's from Mr. Biggs. I don't suppose it's anything to do with what you're researching. Anyway, I, asked, I said, oh, yeah, it is. I said, Thank you. Uh, can you send it over and I'll, I'll take a look at it. And that gives me the clue to the writing desk. So it was kind of like the most unusual piece of research because it was months after we actually we'd almost finished writing the book. And this oh, piece I'm very of this now. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> it's going to drive me mad until I can get my hands on this book. If our listeners want to learn... <laughs> other, than, other than that, I think it's got to be trawling through um, French parish records looking for people. I think that's probably the weirdest thing I've done when you try... My French is equivalent to schoolgirl and, and very little more, and trying to sit and read through and determine whether it's a birth, a marriage, a death, and who it is and when it was and things. I think that's probably... It's been the most time-consuming, if nothing else. <laughs> If our listeners want to learn a bit more about this topic, tell them where they can start and importantly, tell them about your blog and your books and when they can get hold of them. Right. I mean, I would, I would say if you don't know anything about the 18th century, or even if you do, um, I, a bit of a self plug, I guess, is, is to actually just Google all things Georgian. It's, it's probably a good starting point because it's not... It's aimed at anybody and everybody and the stuff from all over the country and uh, men and women. So it's not it's not a it's not a female blog or anything. Um, so I think it's probably a good good starting point. We try to keep it as as easy as easy reading as as possible, so anybody can just sort of dip into it. Their blog posts, so they're only kind of you know fifteen hundred words, something like that. So it's a dip in, dip out. Um, and then if something interests you, then basically take it from there and, and start reading up. There are plenty of 18th century books out there to uh, get your teeth into. But that's a, there's over 600 posts on there. So it's probably quite a, you should find something else <laughs> if you want to learn more about the 18th century. Um, the books, um, our publisher is Pen and Sword. And um, I say they're on Amazon and all good, good retailers. This has been brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. I want to go away now and write a book about spying in the Georgian period and basically completely shatter the whole 007 macho um, mindset and, and basically write a book about female spies. Uh, there, are, this period. Uh, there are, there were other female spies out there. Um, there's the, um, oh goodness, um, Helen, Will uh, Helena, Helen Maria Williams. She was the, um, what do they call her? The Petty Matelo, little sailor. Um, so, and she was a spy. She worked for the, the famous spy master. So, uh, yeah, so she, Rachel Charlotte wasn't the only one out there. Um, and, you know, along with Grace, it, it, but in very different ways. But, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, Women can do other things other than just look like a, a clothes horse, which is what they were expected to, to look like in the 18th century. Absolutely. Amen to that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join... There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 
10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 